Hi, everybody. My name is Neil Veloso. I'm executive director of Brown Technology Innovations and very excited uh, to be part of this panel today uh, called Scaling for Impact. Digital health investors discuss their metrics for success. Uh, we are lucky that uh, Dr. Rani in organizing this conference has brought together a fantastic panel of investors from across the spectrum. I'm going to share my screen and make sure we're good here and just give some brief background uh, on this area of, of digital health, um, really in this context of, of scaling for impact. I, th I don't think a, a day can go by without seeing another digital health deal. Uh, in fact, we saw one just today where Pair Therapeutics uh, which has three FDA approved products uh, for digital therapies, uh, recently became public by merging uh, with the Thimble Point SPAC, which is a term that I'm sure we'll hear of uh, later on in this panel. Uh, to date, um, well, actually for 2020, uh, digital health as an investing class has garnered over $14.1 billion uh, in venture capital and private equity investing. More than ever, there are more repeat investors in digital health. Um, uh, professional institutional investors going back uh, and really uh, expanding their exposure in this growing field. Within digital health, we're seeing that there is a uh, emerging infrastructure that's being leveraged. Uh, companies are taking advantage of existing industries such as uh, pharmacies, um, ways to share the EMR and building new companies and businesses around that. In fact, the pandemic drove telehealth adoption among consumers uh, as to anyone here who has had a um, video visit with their doctor uh, can attest to. We're seeing that enterprise buyers are committed to digital health. In fact, the largest buyer of them all, the federal government allowed for telehealth uh, patient visits and the VA uh, is looking to expand its footprint into digital health. All of this on the public markets have been driven by a uh, treasure trove of IPOs and SPAC mergers that really drove um, public company activity among digital health startups. And really in that background, we wanna know what's next uh, in this field. You know, how can you scale it? I think in that, in that regard, we are very lucky uh, to be joined by our panelists today, um, whom I'll introduce. Aiko, Aik, hi, is a principal over at Acme, uh, where she focuses on digital health, fintech, and consumer investments. Uh, Acme is a early stage VC firm based in San Francisco. And they've invested in some of the most iconic companies of our generation, including Uber, Airbnb, uh, and DraftKings. Dr. Keith Kerman uh, has joined us. Keith, welcome. Uh, Keith is an operating partner with the Riverside Company, where he helps lead uh, their healthcare practice. Riverside is a private equity firm uh, that's focused on middle market growth companies with over $9 billion uh, in management. Uh, Dr. Kerman has an MD from Brown, an MBA from Warden, and he's worked as a physician, operating executive, and a board member. Dr. Rajiv Kumar uh, has joined us. Rajiv, welcome. Uh, Rajiv is a co-founder of the Brown Angel Group, which is a global network of 750 angel investors who will pool their capital uh, to support early stage startups that are founded by Brown alumni. Uh, Dr. Kumar previously served as the president and chief medical officer of Virgin Pulse, which is a private equity backed software as a service company. And finally, uh, Anisha Mehta uh, from Bain Capital Ventures has joined us, uh, where she is a partner. Anisha joined Bain in 2017 and focuses on venture and growth stage investments in both healthcare technologies and services. Uh, she's a board member and observer at companies like Apixio, Calderos, Centivo, and VetSource. So really, we are very fortunate uh, to have this excellent panel uh, with us today. So everyone, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining. Why don't we get started? 
And really just as a round table session here, you know, given the diversity uh, of this panel, uh, tell us about your experiences uh, in digital health innovation. Speak to your investing or even your entrepreneurial activities uh, in this space. Uh, Keith, uh, if you could start things off. Um, sure, Keith, Keith Kerman here. And Neil, thanks for the nice intro. And it's a pleasure to be speaking with everyone this afternoon. And I, I hope we can, uh, even in the, within the confines of Zoom, make it, uh, make it conversational, have it going back and forth. Um, so, you know, we, we've been very active at, uh, at Riverside in, in healthcare. It's about 25% of our portfolio, um, everything. You know, and, and digital health is one of those, I won't say it's a misnomer these days, but it's hard to be involved in, um, in a company, whether it's in healthcare or any, other, other, or any of our other verticals where digital isn't a major component of it. And it is certainly one of the major drivers Neil, behind the IPO and SPAC metrics that you were highlighting out there. You know, the, 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 the common um, trope within the investment world is that, uh, you know, software is currently eating the world and it's going to continue. And I think we're certainly seeing that in, in healthcare too. So we've been involved in things, everything from, from uh, developing a platform that uh, was for payers and providers to verify insurance status, um, company by the name of Passport Health that you know, became part of Experian. Um, MDON is very, very active in that region as well. We had a company that did uh, surgical instrument management so that, that health systems could track and better utilize their inventory. We're just exiting now a company that um, does, uh, does um, financial workflow management for the clinical trials industry to facilitate patient convenience, make sure that expenses are covered and that our payments are made in an appropriate time and appropriate fashion to health systems and investigators who need that cash flow in order to, uh, to run their practices and to make sure that the trial is done appropriately. And we've got a digital counseling platform um, focused mainly, well, initially on weight loss, but now moving into um, anxiety management and hypertension and elimination of, um, of conditions that uh, lead to a metabolic syndrome. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of probably, I don't know, 150 different platforms out there that are trying to do that right now. So there's a huge amount of activity um, across the spectrum right now, and it really touches all portions of what's going on in the, uh, the healthcare enterprise. I'll stop there and happy to take questions, but would love to hear from Ike and, and, and Rajiv and others in terms of what they're doing. Rajiv, please, you, know, you have a great perspective as, as both a founder, as an inventor or investor. Yeah, thanks Neil and, and thanks Megan and, and the rest of the crew for having me. Um, I got my start in digital health about 15 years ago um, in 2006, I think before digital health was really even a terminology that was used very often. Um, and so I certainly hadn't been using the term, um, but I was in medical school at Brown and I got very interested in obesity and in sort of social uh, solutions to uh, helping people transform their lifestyle. Uh, so I created a nonprofit organization called Shape Up Rhode Island that eventually morphed uh, into a for-profit company called Shape Up. Uh, and basically it was a social platform uh, with uh, financial incentives and um, connected wearables uh, to help people uh, exercise, eat healthier, lose weight, um, and overall improve their health. And uh, we found a customer in large self-insured employers. Um, and so over 10 years, we, we built that business, selling it to, to large Fortune 500 companies. Um, very circuitous pathway. I dropped out of medical school for three years to build the company, uh, much to my mother's dismay, and then went back and, and got my degree and then went back to the company. Uh, but anyways, all told, we, we ran that company for 10 years, and then we sold it in 2016 to a competitor called Virgin Pulse. Uh, Virgin was partially owned by uh, Richard Branson's Virgin Group and also by Insight Venture Partners, a private equity firm in New York. Um, I stayed on with Virgin for five years uh, and uh, helped lead. I was the chief medical officer, the head of data science, and then I also helped lead M&A. Um, we did a classic private equity style roll-up. Uh, in the employee health space. Uh, we acquired nine businesses in five years, 
uh, and we took Virgin Pulse to about 300 million of revenue and about 100 million of EBITDA. Uh, so really one of the largest kind of scaled digital health uh, providers in the employer space. Um, I left the company at the end of last year. And since then I've been putting my effort into um, personal angel investing. I've invested in a, a number of uh, digital health companies where I'm also an advisor. And then also Neil, as you mentioned, the Brown Angel Group uh, and a number of the deals that we've done through Brown Angel Group have also been in digital health companies. Uh, also exploring a digital health SPAC and a digital health venture fund. So uh, this topic is very much up my alley and um, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Hey, you bring a great perspective being based in San Francisco, you know, the home of, of startups and, and early stage VC. Thanks everyone, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I actually didn't get my start in healthcare at all. Um, I was a serial entrepreneur, started a few companies of my own, uh, did a corporate detour at the New York Stock Exchange and JP Morgan's primarily financial services um, until I was diagnosed with cancer, uh, completely out of left field, never been hospitalized before, never broken a bone in my body. Um, and it was a really, eye-opening experience, the year that I had uh, getting from diagnosis to, to treatment. Um, spent every single interaction that I had with the healthcare system um, with the question in mind of maybe there's a company to be started here. So treated every conversation as a user interview. And I think that was just a coping mechanism on my part. Uh, but from the surgeon to the endocrinologist, to the cardiologist, to the medical biller, et cetera, just was really curious to hear about what their pain points were. And when I switched over to the investing side um, uh, about five years ago, um, really made healthcare the bulk of my focus uh, from an investment perspective. So since then, uh, Acme, which is the early stage firm uh, that I'm a part of, we've invested in companies like Q, uh, which has the first at-home PCR COVID test um, it's a device this small. I'd like to think about it as Theranos that works. Um, it will be able to do pretty much everything that a Quest can do. Uh, obviously, we have to go through FDA approval for each of the tests, but we are approved for our COVID test. So that should be hopefully be in everyone's homes uh, sooner than later. Uh, we were early investors in Doctor in Demand, which is now merging with uh, Grand Rounds. Um, we're also early investors in PillPack, which Amazon bought for a billion a couple of years ago, Digital Pharmacy. Um, and some of our more recent investments include the Pill Club, a subscription birth control uh, in the US for women, uh, Curology, which is right now, I think, one of the two biggest direct-to-consumer healthcare companies out there. It's a direct-to-consumer acne treatment company. Um, we were the first money into that company. Um, Brightside, telepsychiatry for med management, um, TIA, full stack women's Women's Health Clinic, first clinic is in New York. We just opened a second one uh, down in LA. Um, and Airx Health, which is building out a platform to be able to do remote patient monitoring for Medicare patients. Um, so we really focus on early stage, anywhere, call it from your seed stage to series B. Um, and I think one of the foundational thesis that we invest out of, and we can talk a little bit about this uh, during, during our conversation is, there are simply not going to be enough providers um, as we see shortages across a lot of different verticals um, and, and specialties. And we see technology as a change agent, hopefully, to be able to augment providers that are in the field today to be able to serve more patients uh, with, with better outcomes. Um, so that's where we've made some of the most, uh, I think, interesting investments uh, so far. Um, and we are continuing to see that play out in more and more subspecialties. That's great. Thank you, Ake. Anisha, you started out tracking public companies before you moved to the private side with investing. I did. Yeah. Um, so, so my background is entirely digital health investing. As, as you mentioned, I started in the public market, I actually started in healthcare consulting very briefly, but quickly moved to the investing side and was, was covering companies like Teladoc and Cerner and Athena Health. These were really the, the first group of publicly traded healthcare technology companies. It was called healthcare IT, not digital health at the time. And 
the the old school EMRs were really the the large companies of note in the space that had all all of the market cap in the space. But started there, saw kind of the the first evolution of digital adoption. So you know before before EMRs, none of what we're investing in now could exist. That nothing was nothing was digitized and going forward, it's, it's a totally different landscape. Once you have digital data as a baseline, there's so, so much more you can do. So at, I was at Fidelity um, investing also in some private companies. So Fidelity can invest 1% of its funds into private privately held companies, which ends up being a lot of capital when you're a multi-trillion dollar <laughs> investment company. But um, just, just found that I, I wanted to go earlier and, and came over to Bain Capital Ventures in 2017. We are the venture and growth equity arm of Bain Capital. So Bain is structured as nine different funds, each of which fundraises themselves, has separate LPs, makes completely separate investment decisions. So really we're this autonomous vehicle under this, this big Bain Capital umbrella. And we're investing across stages, everything from $100,000 seed checks all the way up to $100 million growth checks in pre-IPO companies. And most of us are domain focused. So I still spend all of my time in healthcare and all of that in software and services within healthcare. Mostly, most companies I look at have at least some kind of software component, but we will, we will do a little bit of peer services as well. And uh, we're, we're quite active. So we're generally sitting on boards and, and getting very involved in our companies and we'll stick with them for a, a year to 15 years, depending on the needs of the company and, and the, the scale and growth trajectory. Thanks, Anisha. You made a great point too with, with the, the timeline and involvement uh, you know, with your investments. A great question came up from the audience um, you know, particularly in, in the light of, of, of the current markets, how can the everyday individual invest, be a stakeholder uh, in digital health? Is, is digital health a retail activity or, or is it, should it be the domain of, of professional money managers? I don't know who wants to go first there. I mean, uh, we could we could generalize the question is, uh, or should should individual stocks be the, the domain of individual investors or is it best left to institutional funds? Obviously all of us do it and uh, and feel somewhat conflicted about it. It's just hard with uh, the, the basis of information out there. Uh, not, not to be too flip, I mean, the answer would be, sure, there are lots of companies out there and there's lots of available information, but it, it comes with all the travise that uh, investing in, in public vehicles uh, always come with. I would just add that, I, you know, I think for the first time in history, uh, retail investors have access to earlier stage digital health companies as more and more companies go public through SPACs. Um, and so, you know, as a retail investor, you now have the ability to invest in a company like HIMSS uh, or Talkspace, or um, you know maybe some of the more controversial ones like Clover or Multiplan, you know. So I, I, there's a there's a really a, a large cohort of companies that have gone public um, through SPACs or through traditional routes, um, and and more so they're lining up to to do that. And so I do think that retail investors have an opportunity to get into these companies at earlier stages of growth and reap the benefits of of future growth that's going to come. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting question, you know, uh, and, and maybe it leads to, to the next question uh, for this panel. Um, you know, is digital health an area that you could apply sort of traditional approaches to investing to, to analyze uh, these opportunities? Or is it something, you know, entirely different? Um, you know, uh, Ake, uh, some, what are some of the criteria uh, that you use uh, when you uh, when you look at companies uh, in digital health uh, for investment? I think the, the big disclaimer here is each stage of investing will have different sets of criteria, right? So if you're looking at public companies, typically there is some kind of methodology in which Wall Street analysts are looking at those companies and seeing whether or not it's a good buy or if you should sell. Um, in the area where I spend most of my time in, which is early stage investing, you often don't have quantitative data points. Um, a lot of it is looking at the market 
uh, where, where the founder wants to build the company? Um, what's the competitive landscape? Uh, what are potential unit economics? Typically, you don't even have enough proof points to see uh, money being exchanged or transactions being done. So do you believe that they're going to be able to fulfill the unit economic uh, unit economics plan that they, they put out? Um, and is it going to be the right team to be able to execute that plan? Um, so oftentimes, you know, this is why a lot of private investing is not necessarily available to the public because the set of criteria can be so opaque and it's not something that a retail investor um, would necessarily have information around. Um, but broadly, I mean, that's from a venture capital perspective, but the way that we look at early healthcare investing is, you know, do we believe that the founder is mission aligned? This is actually something that's really, really important in the last 10 years um, where it's never been as easy as now to start a digital health company. Um, and a lot of times you see people start companies for the wrong reasons. Um, obviously it's a commercial activity and people want to make money and can be opportunistic, but it's very different building a healthcare company than an e-commerce company. If you sell a piece of shirt uh, that didn't work out, you're not really hurting anyone. You may have to refund that money to your customer, but with healthcare, you're dealing with people's bodies um, and, and people's health. Um, so we really, really care about founders who are mission aligned, who care most about patient outcome um, than just making a quick buck. The other thing that I would note is um, there are a lot of regulatory complexities in early stage uh, digital investing. Um, you know, you're seeing this with telemedicine where each state might have different regulations around what counts as a virtual visit or what are the requirements before you have that virtual visit. Um, how do pharmacies work in each state um, in terms of the ability to be able to compound your own drugs or prescribing drugs? So. Those are things that we see, you know, regardless of the idea, we try to understand if there's a regulatory pathway um, that will help the growth. Um, unlike other tech investments where if you have product market fit, you can just scale. I think in healthcare, there are certain ceilings that we, we're more mindful of. Yeah, I think that's a really, uh, really great summary. A couple of things I would add, Neil, you asked the question, is this similar to other domains or, or is there something fundamentally different about healthcare? And I do think there are a couple of key differences. I, I find that my colleagues that are looking at early stage investments in other domains can often say, this is the best product and or the best team in a market and therefore they will win. In healthcare, I don't always find that the best products win and I don't always find that the best teams or the scrappiest teams win because there are so many complicated incentives in healthcare. So I, I often try to, to look at where dollars are flowing and where incentives are going and say, well, this is a fantastic product. No physician is incentivized to use it because of the unfortunate structure of, of the way the healthcare system is set up. So these incredible founders are going to run up against a wall as they try to, to commercialize this. So it, it is tricky. It's, it's, you, you need to look beyond just incredible products and say, well, this is actually a simple product, but it fits the current incentive structure. There are existing market tailwinds that will lead to the adoption of this product. Therefore, this can be a large company. And that is, it's a little bit of a different way of looking at the market than my colleagues look at it in, in other domains. So that's something I, I really try to spend a lot of time in and focus on. Keith, you're about to, uh, to add something. Yeah, I was just gonna um, ask, uh, you know, Ake and Anisha Rajiv, if they've got good rules or a good advice for, for those, those of us listening in terms of how to determine that someone is mission driven and really committed. I just, I mean, it, um, it's hard and I, I tend to want to believe people. I, I, so I'm very interested in sort of the criteria that we could either use as investors or that um, the entrepreneurs on the phone could use to, to help sort of calibrate uh, what they're trying to do. 
I would say to that is people are always showing you who they are. You just have to listen. Um, I think really paying attention on what they're saying, what they're choosing to focus on. If a founder is pitching and is spending 100% of the time talking about market opportunity, but not necessarily patient outcomes and clinical protocols and how they're going to achieve uh, uh, the standard of care, that's a yellow flag. Um, so that's from the interactions with the founder. On the other hand, we also reference people a lot. We will talk to people that they've offered uh, for us to talk to. We will also blind reference, we'll cold call and reach out to people uh, who we may have in common to just get a better understanding of who they are as a person, how they think, how they make their decisions, um, prior work experience, et cetera. So uh, those are kind of the two strategies that we typically employ. Thanks. I'll just add a, a couple of other things. That, those are all great points that I agree with. Um, one of the things that I look for specifically in, in healthcare, you know, digital health founders is focus. Um, you look for that in any founder, but um, I often find that digital health companies will, will pitch me and say, we built this great product and we're going to sell it to payers and providers and to employers, and we're going to go direct to consumer. And they haven't really quite figured who, uh, who is the true stakeholder that has the main pain point and that will actually have a willingness to pay. And so I always look for that focus and, and try to work with companies to help them truly understand, you know, who is the end customer. And, and maybe ultimately you'll build a product that can be sold, you know, to all of those different stakeholders. But, but generally the companies that succeed are the ones that pick one and, and really nail that go to market um, and scale within that particular uh, customer base. So that's one. Um, two is, um, you know, with any a company you're investing in, you look for resilience in the founding team. I think you especially have to look for resilience and grit um, in healthcare founders because building a healthcare company is a slog. Um, you know, and, and Anisha talked about all the regulatory issues and, you know, there's so much that you have to go through. Uh, things are changing all the time. Uh, sales cycles are long. Uh, the healthcare industry is slow to change. And so you really have to have a high level of resilience and commitment uh, to really see the, the venture through. And then the final thing I would say is really um, a, a commitment to clinical research. Um, and this goes along with the point um, that Ica was making, making about, you know, caring about outcomes. But, you know, the companies that I've seen that really separate themselves from the pack and go on to scale and do really well are the ones that invest it early on in deep, longitudinal, robust clinical research. Um, and they made those investments and they continued to do that and they committed to it over time. And that becomes one of their greatest competitive advantages and competitive moats. And, and those research studies and those outcomes become their greatest sales and marketing tool, um, you know, above and beyond anything else that they could produce. So um, I, I look for that, you know, early on, are, are they thinking in that vein? Do they understand the importance of, of clinical research and are they investing in it early? That's a-, that's a Yeah, just a- Go ahead, Anita, just, just to even emphasize that focus point, your first point further, I, I could not agree more. That's so incredibly important. And something I often look at is early founders can have a temptation to take any contract that comes their way and accept it as, you know, revenue is revenue and business is business. Let, we'll, we'll figure out the focus point later. Or we'll figure out product market fit later. I find that the best founders are often more selective and will say, no, this doesn't fit what we're trying to build. We're going to actively turn down an opportunity for revenue today to ensure that we are building this product properly and are building something that can scale. And that kind of discipline is so important, but so challenging. It, it's so tempting in the early days to take anything you can get. If, if you maintain that discipline and focus, I, I think it pays off later. And those are the companies that, that really scale. That's great. You know, Anisha, you brought up a, a, a great point that I think leads to one of our, our poll questions here. So if the, uh, the tech team can post question number nine uh, for the audience, uh, how should digital health companies define success uh, when scaling? Everyone feel free to uh, read the question and, and click. All right, great. We'll come back to those answers uh, shortly. So uh, for our panelists, uh, the audience here, you know, uh, primarily, you know, academics uh, from, from Brown, from, from other institutions, um, 
many of whom have sort of, uh, you know, observed or maybe even taken part in, in the growing um, role of startups uh, uh, from universities uh, as a form of, of commercialization. Uh, if you were to, to give advice to, to the faculty member, to the clinician, uh, to the attending who's thinking of, of a digital health startup, uh, what would you give them? What, what, what hints, what, what uh, tips or tricks would, would you share? Can we start with, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> and I say that partly to play off the, uh, the, the comments that many of my fellow panelists have made very eloquently about, about commitment, right? I mean, it is, this is very hard to do. It is, it is more than a full-time job. And if you're also a clinician and you're also a researcher, you've got to figure out how you're going to balance those things and whether you can sort of maintain all of them simultaneously. And it's really difficult and and uh, and and, uh, and and resource intensive. So, you, know, you have to decide. You know, uh, per Rajiv's comment about focus, what you really want to do, and how you go want to go about doing it. I think there are some pros and cons to the more academic and and clinician focused background. I, I always look for clinicians as part of the teams, but not the only team members in digital health companies that I'm investing in. I find that on the positive side, you know, clinicians are often bringing this unique perspective of the actual user or the actual end market or the actual incentives that those coming from the business world or the tech world often miss. And in healthcare, it's, it's particularly important to understand the user and really understand what this looks like in practice and how it impacts workflow and how it impacts some aspects that are hard for those outside of healthcare to understand. You know, the existence of fax machi machines is still something that my colleagues can't understand, but it, it's so real in healthcare. And there are many, many examples of that that I think clinicians can can digest in a way others can't. On, on the more challenging side, though, I, I find that the academic mindset can be challenging commercially. So I'll, I'll use that to describe founders. I'll say he's, he's a little too academic in the way he's thinking about pricing or, you know, different various go to market models, because sometimes we need to just simplify things, focus on what matters and move quickly in order to scale. And trying to perfect it is often a bias I see from those with more academic backgrounds. And, and uh, it, it doesn't always work. One day you can perfect your pricing model. You can ensure that every box on your contract is checked and you're getting the, the exact deal that makes sense. But in the early days, sometimes you just need to be scrappy and move quickly. And sometimes that's where the more tech background is, is really complementary. So I like to see both. I, I think both skill sets really matter. And I love it when a team comes with different backgrounds. I think on a personal level, it's important to have the self-reflection to understand what your appetite for risk and ambiguity is. Um, oftentimes, at, and our portfolio companies where, where we do have clinicians, um, it's a bit of an eye-opening experience for them to realize that a startup is basically flying a plane while you're in the process of building it. Um, and, and nothing's gonna be perfect. Things are gonna, bre things are gonna break constantly. Um, and for some people, they love that. And for some people, they don't. Um, so I think that's a, a philosophical question before going into the startup land um, to, to reflect on. Yeah, and I would just say, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead, uh, I think, um, you know, there, there are a number of trade-offs. You know, I get calls all the time from doctors who say, listen, I wanna go join a startup. You know, uh, I wanna get out of medicine. You know, I wanna scale my impact. You know, you did it. Can you tell me how to do it? Um, and, and one kind of eye-opening reality for them is that, you know, their cash compensation is likely to, to, to fall off a cliff, at least in the, in the short term. Um, and often that's really hard for them to grapple with because they have a family and a standard of life and so forth. Um, so being okay with that trade-off between, you know, a salary and upside, you know, and equity and, and having that level of, uh, of risk tolerance 
Um, you know, I think also clinicians and, and others, you know, from an academic setting are used to really linear pathways that are kind of predefined. Um, you know, in, in medicine, you know, there's always the next step predefined for you. Um, it's at set time intervals, your, your cash comp increases at those time intervals. You know, when you join an early stage, you know, company, you know, it is amorphous. Um, it, it's it's going to be determined as you go. And, and um, you know, there's a lot of risk involved there. So I think just kind of being okay with that um, and uh, being willing to sort of jump off the cliff and, and um, you know, take the leap of faith. Um, on the upside, I see that um, for clinicians, they often serve really kind of two important roles in the company. Um, one is they often become the evangelist. Uh, so clients, uh, the marketing team, uh, you know, reporters, they, they always want to talk to the clinician. Um, they don't want to talk to the, 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 you know, the CEO who's just, you know, maybe a, you know, a front man for the company, but they want to, they want to hear the, the outcomes. They want to hear the research. They want to, they want to talk to clinicians. So I think I see a lot of the chief medical officers and, and chief clinical officers becoming the, the spokesperson for the, the digital health businesses. And I think that's really awesome. Um, I also find that the clinician often becomes the North star for the business as well. Um, you know, when you're running a business, sometimes, you know, there's forces that pull you toward doing things that are just about making money uh, or improving margins or, you know, increasing speed. And the clinician can sort of, you know, play that role of reminding people of the mission uh, and kind of redirecting toward what's best for the patient, what's best for the long-term, you know, outcomes of those patients. And I've seen that role. You know, I played that role many times in my in my career as well. Great, thanks for that, Rajiv. Uh, can we put up the uh, the poll uh, answers to question nine? Hmm. So, how can digital health companies define success when scaling? Strategic partnerships took the lead. Uh, customer volume second and size of venture rounds uh, had had no votes. A any reactions uh, from our panel here? I'm very pleased to see the zero percent in size of venture rounds. I will say that is not how I define success by any means. It is it is a useful tool to have capital, but but those are not necessarily the the most successful companies. There are a lot of other factors that matter. I would have said none of the above. Um, I think these are kind of lagging indicators of success. I think you know some of the leading indicators are uh, engagement, uh, whoever whoever your end you know user is, um, retention uh, of your customers, and then the, the actual outcomes and ROI that you're delivering. And I think you know if, if those metrics are all going in the right direction, then you know customer volume, revenue, all that kind of stuff follows. That's great. Thanks. I, I'd second Rajiv on that one. I think. Uh, after none of the, uh, I mean, customer volume is sort of a proxy for users and ROI. That is the assumption that people aren't going to keep using it if, in fact, there's not some kind of value that's created. But it is lagging, not leading. And uh, and whether it's you know whether it's research, whether it's engagement, some of the other terms that have been mentioned, I I, I think actually comes first. Great. All right. Um, for for the panel. Uh, what do you see as emerging areas uh, in digital health? What's, what's the next iteration uh, in this space? Dr. Dr. Ranny said that no one can mention AI, which is, uh, which, which is, is probably a good rule. I mean, uh, a, a friend on, on Wall Street, one of the big banks is, is, is taken so far as to say that, that at this point, uh, the, the, the trope around the table is, the executive table is that, I don't know what the question is, but the answer is AI. And, and, and I think that's sort of where the, where, where, where the market's moving. In, in an effort to, uh, to be specific, I think there are some really exciting um, areas that, uh, that to, to focus on. Um, certainly, I, I think it was, is, is, um, uh, it was Dr. Histon from, from Kaiser mentioned the problem we're having with with data analysis at this this point and the wall of data that's hitting all clinicians and all health systems, we have this incredible amount of of, uh, of information out there. But turning it into not actionable knowledge is hugely challenging. So companies that can help us do that, I think, will have a huge impact. It's it's a more general answer than I like to give, but I think it's a really important one. And then another one that I throw out there is is in the you know, seeing what's, what's happened just this week with the Biogen approval 
and with how the FDA is thinking about new drugs, you know, um, digital solutions to the phase four um, clinical study problem could really impact uh, medical care at a very fundamental level. That is, how do we track outcomes? How do we turn more and more patient encounters into data that can be used to help us figure out, you know, how to raise the level of discourse and how to improve clinical care. And I think that may be doable, but that's certainly a challenge for the next couple of generations. I'll, I'll stop there because I'd love to hear my co-panelists' ideas. Yeah, there are, uh, there are so many that we could point to. I'll, I'll give one more example I'm focused on, which is the engaged and empowered consumer in healthcare. I, I think more so than ever before, we're seeing this, this consumer engagement in in care, both from a you know direct to consumer purchasing standpoint, but also just in home engagement, willingness to get care in different settings, willingness to look at healthcare data, digest healthcare data as a consumer, and use healthcare products as a consumer. So I'm I'm thinking a lot about how can we take advantage of that engagement and take advantage of that empowerment that's occurred in the last year or so, a lot of which has been driven by COVID, frankly, and, and invest in technologies that, that leverage that, that engagement, but also stay connected to the rest of the ecosystem and, and don't further fragment providers. I, I do like to maintain that connection and ensure that, it's, that what we're investing in is really integrated rather than just a side product. I think two areas I'm excited about. Um, one is hardware technology becoming more and more advanced to the point where we're actually uh, going to be able to start to apply them into use cases. So one example of this would be marrying robotics, machine learning, and computer vision to automate the embryology process from end to end. Um, and instead of having embryologists doing manual processes to uh, make embryos. You can just automate the entire thing and potentially augment the results because you have this box that eliminates human error. Um, so that, that's, that's an interesting area. Uh, the second area and at the risk of sounding like a Silicon Valley stereotype, um, I think psychedelics are going to be more and more uh, prevalent um, in 10, 15 years. I think we'll start seeing psychedelics becoming the norm for treating mental health um, versus what we're seeing today with antidepressants. Very interesting, Nick. Thanks for that. Rajiv. Uh, I, you know, I, I definitely agree with Anisha. Consumer is really you know, sort of what I think is a, a top trend. Um, and it's why you've seen the rise of companies like SockDoc and Good RX and Whoop and you know so many others. I think you know consumers are fed up with the healthcare system and they're trying to find out ways to just go around it uh, and, and take control themselves. Um, I guess three other areas that I think a lot about. Um, these aren't really kind of types of companies, but but really just sort of um, themes. Um, one is uh, the idea of software um, integrated with services. You know, when I first got started in digital health, you know, services was like a toxic word. Um, you know, there was an assumption that, you know, services meant, you know, low margins and, um, you know, really hard to scale. And, and if you look at any digital health platform that's been successful, look at Livongo, look at Amada, look at so many others, uh, they all have a really significant human component. Uh, and all of the research shows that when you combine the, the software and technology with the human component, you get the best outcomes. Um, and it turns out that you can actually have great margins you know, I've seen 50, 60, 70% margins on, on services. So I think investors are, are just becoming more open-minded to investing in companies that have a large service component uh, in healthcare. Um, I think a second thing is that um, all digital health companies in one form or another are morphing to become providers. Um, and so, you know, it was mentioned that there's a big provider shortage. I think, you know, anything that's ameliorating that provider shortage that's helping these digital health companies plug into networks of doctors. Um, there's a company called Wheel, uh, which is sort of a white labeled um, network of, of doctors who are you know, available to do telemedicine. You know, it's getting a lot of traction growing quickly. 
Um, I think investors have to get smarter about the provider side. And um, so I think most portfolio companies will, will eventually be really be providers themselves. That's how you sort of, you know, meet patients where they're at and complete that kind of healthcare journey. Um, and then I think the final thing is there's going to be a lot of consolidation. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of companies. There's a lot of cognitive load on the side of buyers as well as on the side of consumers. And uh, I think as investors, we have to you know, really help our portfolio companies exercise their M&A muscle more um, and uh, get smarter about the M&A strategy. Uh, and, and I think we're going we're gonna to see a lot of that consolidation happening in the next five years. All right. Thank you for that. You know, I just to throw uh, one, one more in there, sorry sure. to interrupt. Just going to have to mention just on, on the behavioral side. There's so, and you know, I'm saying this because the the audience here, many of the the academic participants are going to be, I think, um, uh, integral in making this this happen. There's just a huge opportunity, and I, I know for the clinicians on the line, there's a lived experience on that. This, so I, I feel um, a little bit embarrassed almost to bring it up. But having said that, you know, the idea that whether it's adolescents or adults need to go live somewhere for a month. And spend you know thirty to fifty thousand dollars on an intervention is just a you know it's an old model that needs to be improved. I think there's a huge opportunity for that. I think you know consumers want something different, providers want something different, and and this audience could really have a big impact in helping make that 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 happen. And I know the investment community is is hungry for solutions there and eager to find alternatives to the models that are that are uh, seem to be ascendant right now. Great. What, what great insights from everyone. You know, Keith, Rajiv, Aik, Anisha, thank you uh, for this. Um, this has been our panel, Scaling for Impact, uh, Digital Health Investors um, Speak. And hopefully uh, join us for, for the poster session and see what the next generation of, of innovators are doing. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Neil. Thank you to all four of you for joining us and, and doing this panel. Well, this closes out the main session um, of our CDH virtual conference on digital health for the post-pandemic world. Um, there's a couple of slides that Jake is gonna put up for me. Excellent, thank you. So to close, before you guys all go off to the student sessions, um, I wanna do a really big thank you um, to our four moderators, Nicole, well, Dr. Nugent, Dr. Rosen, Mr. Veloso and Dr. Ray, and also a thank you to Drs. Babineau, Elias, and Ja for their support of the center. Um, welcome you guys. If I know that we didn't even begin to scratch the surface of the audience questions. We do do seminars and a number of other events and would encourage you to join us there. And Jake, if I can have the next slide. Um, I also wanna do the hugest of shout outs to our staff. Um, Emily Kutak, Becca Laferriere, Anika Naim, who's one of our students, John Petenia, who is the director of the center, the um, project director for the whole center and who has been the driving force behind this today, and Leah Salzano, who's one of our senior research assistants. So thank you to the five of them for putting the conference together. Next slide. And finally, a huge thank you to Brown Lifespan and to Mosio for helping to sponsor this conference. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, Mosio is an excellent text message uh, vendor who we've worked with for development and dissemination of interventions in the past. Um, I will encourage you all to go and join a student session and also to keep your eyes open for an evaluation link. Thank you for joining us. Look forward to your feedback and to staying in touch. Have a great day and here's to better digital, digital health for the future um, as we move out of this post out of this pandemic world. Thank you all. Have a great day. See you in the breakout rooms.